Hi, my name is Adrienne Usher, and I am the Director of Research for the Chappelle Roster Project. Um, my colleagues, Alex Apito on the left and Caitlin Winkler, we are very excited to talk to you about our project, and we thank you for coming today. We're going to start our presentation uh, by showing you a 10-minute video um, about our project, um, and it explains uh, something about the resources that we are discussing today. The video was produced by the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation, which is the organization we work for. Um, they have a lot of different projects. Um, the one that we're talking about today is just one of them. But if you're interested in more information about the foundation, you can go to chappelle.org. Anyone who works on American Jewish history in the 19th century is going to get the question, well, how many Jews fought in the Civil War? And how many on each side? The goal of the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation's roster project is to identify as best we can every single man who served in the Civil War who was Jewish. In 1895, Washington, D.C.-based lawyer named Simon Wolf wrote a book called The American Jew, Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen. He wrote this book in response to the claim that Jews were not patriotic. And once the scholarly study of American Jewish history got going and people looked critically at that list, they realized it's inadequate and yet that's the book that exists. Hidden in the records at the National Archive is a great deal of information about these individuals as individuals because their families often wrote for pensions, and from those letters and the documentation, we could paint a much more accurate picture. The roster will not only tell us about Jewish soldiers who fought in the Civil War, it will tell us an enormous amount about those soldiers. On the roster project, my main responsibility is pulling files at the National Archive for soldiers whose names came from Simon Wolf's book. We look at each individual soldier listed and we expand on them. We find out if they served in the Civil War and we also try to confirm whether or not they were actually Jewish. We look at two types of files, compiled military service records and the pension records. It was a 19th century norm to name profiles. Every traditional, you know, Jewish sounding names, they all made it into this roster. Where the information can be helpful when you have a soldier whose birth was recorded in a synagogue, marriage records are great for confirming a soldier is Jewish. In the record that we looked at this morning, um, the soldier had a death certificate that was sent over from his widow in Germany. It was in German, which was really interesting, but the Bureau of Pensions also employed translators. And so we have a translation of his death certificate, which says not only that he was of the Jewish faith, but it also mentions that his father was a rabbi. Personally known, living in Greer, gave notice that Mr. Adolf Meyer, 69 years old, Jewish faith, living in Greer, died February 26, 1907, 7.30 a.m. So we were able to confirm that Adolf Meyer was Jewish by looking at his death certificate. We allow for you know, Jewish law, so, you know, a soldier's mother was Jewish. We also allow for Jewish by genealogy. A lot of times they immigrated as a result of anti-Semitic issues in their home country. Being Jewish fell a little low on the priority list, so even though they were Jewish, they didn't live an outwardly Jewish lifestyle. Ways we can confirm people are Jewish outside of your basic birth, death, and marriage information include newspaper searches, contemporary accounts of the soldier, local histories. Every single day, more and more historic references are digitized. I use open source. Anything that is available 
legally to access them through the internet or even hard copies, online digitized newspapers, Fold3, Ancestry, and just generally information that is out there in the internet. Uh, when we see contemporary accounts in pension records from other soldiers, sometimes there'd only be one, two, three Jews in a regiment, and so that's how a soldier would be known in the regiment. This is Samuel Jacobs. During the war, he served under the alias Charles or Charlie Davis. I recall that his correct name was Jacobs. Can't say as to his correct given name. The boys used to jolly him about his fictitious name. Yes, he was a Jew. They called him the Sheeny. I recollect that very well. A lot of immigrants who came over from Germany didn't want their family back in the old country to worry, so they would enlist in, under aliases. We started reading these accounts because the War Department would want to know, well, why did you serve under an alias? If they died, they knew that names of the fallen were published in newspapers overseas and they didn't want their mother to know. One of the most decorated Jewish soldiers that has struck me is Sergeant Major Carpelli's. He was a color bearer. A color bearer has to be in front of the unit, leading them, because gun smoke creates uh, difficulty seeing what's going on. You cannot necessarily hear the orders of your officers over the roar of musketry, but you can see if the flag's moving forward, you're following that flag. So can the enemy. The enemy aims at the flag. In the 1840s, the late 1840s, there were a bunch of revolutions over in Europe, over class, distinctions, monarchies, things like that, different boundary disputes. It put forward the same ideas that common man could rule himself that was covered in the French Revolution and our own revolution. We call the men who fought in that, those revolutions were kind of these free thinkers of the period, 48ers. A lot of those men found their way over to America after their movements failed and they were enemies of their states. And they came to the United States um, generally having military experience and so a lot of these 48ers became officers. Many of those men in the communities that were forming companies of militia were the only people that had ever heard guns fired in anger. They became the drill masters, the sergeants. In 2020, we've had some recent uh, rather exciting developments in terms of the research we're doing, and so we're postponing our, our launch date. Um, but 
one of the things that we always let descendants know is please do contact us if you have questions, if you have information. We're 100%, um, you know, very grateful for um, any interactions with descendants. So we're happy to share with you what, what we've found um, about your ancestors. So that's kind of it for me for now. I'm going to turn it over to Alex, who's uh, going to start the, going through our presentation. Hello. So how many people who are here today know if they have an ancestor that served in the Civil War? A couple? That's great. So how many people aren't sure if they've had an ancestor that served in the Civil War, but your family was here in the United States during the 1860s? Okay. That's good. How many people have looked at their ancestors' pension records at the National Archives in D.C.? We have one, two, two, great. So Civil War pension records are not only great resources um, for chronicling your family's history, but also their military service, and they have great genealogical resources contained within them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so one of the first uh, sets of documents we're going to talk about are questionnaires and declarations. Um, these are all the documents we're going to show today are found within um, Civil War pension records at the National Archives. Um, so one of the most useful genealogical tools found in these records are questionnaires. Um, they were completed by the soldiers themselves, and there were a few different versions of these forms over the years that ask for varying information. But in general, you can expect to find information like addresses, birth date, birthplace, marriage, and names of children. This questionnaire on the left lists the soldier's name, his wife's name, and maiden name, the date and location of their marriage, who the ceremony was performed by, if an official record of their marriage exists, and asks the soldier if he or his wife have been previously married. Uh, this soldier also happens to list all of his children and their birthdays, which is really great. Um, declarations or applications for pensions, which is the form on the right here, um, are filled out by the soldier or his dependents. Um, and his dependents could be uh, his widow, his minor children, or his parents if he were unmarried. Declarations explain why the applicant is applying for a pension. And reasons that could be claimed on a pension application could be disability incurred during or after the war, his age, or his financial need at the time. Depending on who is submitting the form, declarations can, can also include vital statistics, such as addresses, birth, birthplace, death, or marriage information. On this declaration, the soldier's widow lists the name of their five children, their birth dates, and their places of birth, which is really interesting because this one shows that the family moved from France to New York to Alsace to Switzerland between 1870 and 1886. So that would be really difficult to determine otherwise. Um, affidavits and depositions are also found in the pension records and they're extremely useful. Um, they may include information on immigration, family history, the soldier's residence, uh, personal details, vital statistics, information about their neighborhood, their occupation, memberships in clubs and organizations, and this really gives us a snapshot into their daily lives as well, which is really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to switch over now. Um, so what we're going to talk about next is how we can use the documents that Alex just described, how to track your ancestor across time and place. And she went into it a little bit, but we're going to go in a little more detail. <laughs> so addresses. Addresses provided in the pension records are given on dated forms and can tell you exactly where your ancestor lived on a specific date and help you connect him to city directories and censuses. Soldiers would also account for all of the places they lived from when they were discharged from the military until when they submitted their pension applications in these documents. These records are like having a cheat sheet to your ancestors' movement around the country. The soldier on the left stated he lived in New York from his discharge until 1872, Boston from 1872 to 1898, St. Louis from 1898 to 1899, back to Boston until 1916, then to New York, 1916 to 1921, and then Boston a third time where he was living when this form was submitted. 
That would have been a doozy to determine in the census records or address books. <laughs> Lastly, these forms also include occupations, which can help you narrow down which Moses Abraham is your Moses Abraham in the city directory or census. Some of these forms even asked for occupations at enlistment and at the time the soldier was applying for a pension. So on the form on the left, the soldier stated he was a bookbinder when he enlisted in the army, but described his present occupation as taking care of an office in 1904. So all details to help you distinguish your ancestor from other people. All right. So in addition to the soldier's personal accounts, you will also find uh, that the official records containing vital statistics and pensions. So birth records from Europe, as you all know, I'm sure, can be very difficult to locate sometimes. Not only do we find these in pension records, but they typically have translations already completed because the Bureau of Pensions needed to be able to read them. Soldiers would submit these records to prove birth dates in order to receive age-based pensions. So really great that the Bureau of Pensions hired translators. We also find birth certificates for soldiers' children. These were submitted as proof of marriage, issue of the marriage, and used in minor pension claims. A good pension record is like your ancestor hired a genealogist for you. If a widow was applying for a pension, she had to submit proof of marriage to the soldier, except, of course, if she were living in Chicago after the Great Fire of 1871, she may not have had access to her records. I know we're probably all familiar with these gaps from fires and other natural disasters. Death certificates could be submitted either for a widow or a dependent pension claims, or if someone was looking to be reimbursed for burial costs of a soldier. Okay, so what kinds of specific Jewish-only documents would you guys guess you might find in a pension record? Any thoughts? We didn't think we'd find any, and we were thrilled that we did. <laughs> so, who would have guessed you'd read about circumcision in a pension record? The affidavit on the left is an accounting of a bris for a deceased soldier provided by his parents. It reads, I also certify that Albert Snowberger, son of the above parties, was circumcised in my presence on North Frank Street above Poplar on Friday, April 11th, 1845, by Jacob Lipman, the said A.S., having been born on April 4th of the same year. On the right is a bris record from the Moyle submitted by a widow about her children with the soldier, where he states he did on the 10th day of January, 1867, being the eighth day after birth, circumcise Abraham Katz, being the son of Moses and Rachel Katz. Also, he did on the 21st of October, 1868, circumcise David Katz, son of Moses and Rachel Katz. The above dates are extracts from his official record, which also shows the date of birth of said children as follows. Abraham, born January 2nd, 1867, and David, born October 14th, 1868. As I'm sure you guys are familiar with, a lot of states, especially in this, well, a lot of places, especially in this country, didn't have birth certificates for quite some time. So these were sometimes the only accountings people could find of either their own age or their children's age to prove for age-based pensions or parentage. Bar mitzvahs, another right we were really surprised to read about in pensions, bar mitzvahs, not a lot of 13-year-olds fighting in the war, although we do have one or two. <laughs> From the deposition on the left, deponent further states that he is positive that he was over the age of 13 years when he arrived in America on September 9th or 11th, 1857, for the reason that he had some time previous and before he left Europe performed the religious duties required of him upon his arrival at the age of 13 years, and which duties, according to his religion, could not have been performed before he became the age of 13 years. And then the affidavit on the right reads that at the age of 13 years, he was confirmed according to the rites of the Hebrew church of which no record is obtainable. So, and in the, in the soldier's lifetime, he couldn't find a record of his own bar mitzvah. So we certainly aren't going to be able to find it now. But now we have his own account of it in these affidavits, which is amazing. Whenever we find a ketubah in a record, it is extremely bittersweet. As a living document, it should have been returned to the widow. 
and sometimes it was not. It's good for us now, though, because it's preserved at the National Archives and still available and extant for us to use in our research and any descendant to be able to go and see in perfect climate-controlled conditions. The other positive for those who do not know how to read Hebrew is that these will have translations, if not in English. The Bureau of Pensions had a Hebrew translator on staff who is actually also one of our soldiers in the database, which was really exciting to find out. And burial records. So burial records were submitted for reimbursement for funeral expenses for the soldiers and other pensioners. These can potentially show burial in Jewish cemeteries and preparation for burial by Jewish funeral homes, as well as the use of Jewish burial rites, like you'll see watchers on the list of costs or shrouds and practices, giving us a glimpse of how their end of life was celebrated. So we have a few unexpected discoveries that we've made over the years. So this is our miscellaneous category. Uh, we didn't find the items we're going to talk about very often, but when we do, we are very excited. So we wanted to share some of them with you. First one is photographs. Um, can anyone here maybe think of a reason that you might find a photograph in a pension record? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, we've seen that before. Yeah? Yes, we will also get to that. Yes, that is another reason. So it's interesting because those are definitely our reasons we find photographs and pensions, but the main reason, which we were a little kind of unaware of before we started the project, um, we've reviewed over 5,000 pension files, and out of all of those, whenever we find a photo, it's almost always to establish the soldier's identity because he either used an alias during the war or he changed his name after his service. Aliases were used for multiple reasons. Most commonly was that the soldier was underage, and or he was hiding his military service from his parents. Another reason a soldier would have a different name from the one he served under is that he Americanized his name at some point during his life. One exception to this is the amazing portrait at the bottom right of the screen um, of a soldier's wife. Um, a soldier submitted this portrait to ensure that the Bur Bureau of Pensions would be familiar with her while he was still alive, should she need to apply for a pension after his death. Such forethought. So kind of him. Um, all different kinds of letters can be found in pension claims. Letters sent home from the front during a soldier's service, letters from the soldier giving personal accounts of his life to those examining his claim, uh, supportive letters from friends and fraternal organi organizations such as the GAR, B'nai B'rith, and other membership organizations. Uh, sometimes we also find letters from politicians or influencers trying to push a claim through government backlog. One of our most favorite letters that we've ever found um, is this one in the center of your screen, um, written by Eleanor Roosevelt, many years after the soldier's death, uh, supporting a daughter's claim for a pension. It was a really great find. Um, as someone already brought up, we see medical drawings and photographs. Uh, this is one of my personal favorite things to find in pension record. Um, medical drawings and photographs were often submitted by soldiers to establish permanent physical disability and the nature of his injuries. Um, sometimes they can be a bit graphic. We have a few that are slightly more graphic than this that we did not include. Um, but after all, this is war, so it makes sense. All right, and Caitlin is going to walk you through pension indexes. Okay, so the handout we provided with the lecture gives you very detailed, helpful instructions for how to request your ancestors pension either in person at the National Archives in DC or remotely, or we're gonna go into it a little bit, but if your ancestors pension was taken possession, uh, newer pensions were given over to the VA in the early 20th century. So there is a smaller subset that are organized by VA numbers. Most of them are also housed in DC at Archives One, but some of them are also at the Archives facility in St. Louis. And the handout also explains if your ancestor is one of those people whose pensions is in St. Louis, how you can request that remotely. But trying to figure out if your ancestor has a pension or you know your ancestor served, looking for them. These are what the indexes look like. These are what you're gonna need, and this will help tell you whether or not your trip to DC is going to be fruitful. 
The index on the left is the T289 pension index. These are accessible online at fold3.com, which is Ancestry's military site. These also, all, all the indexes can be accessed on the archives online for free, the archives website, but they're a lot harder to find. So the nice thing, if you travel to the archives or a library, you can access them for free on Ancestry as well as if you don't have a paid subscription, so. But the index on the left has its own genealogical information on it before we even open a record. Uh, so obviously at the top we have the soldier's name and then we have late rank and his regiment and company. So this is also gonna help you find him in other military records, uh, his enlistment and discharge dates. And then next we have the pension numbers themselves. So the numbers on the left are the application numbers. Some soldiers indexes you'll find will only have application numbers. That does not mean that there are not files available. There are most of the time and they can have a lot of information in them depending on how long your ancestor fought with the Bureau of Pensions for their claim. So some of them you'll find quite extensive records because they're writing back and forth trying to establish that they should be getting benefits. Um, the number on the right is the certificate number um, and the higher the number, the later it was when the pension claim was granted. The second line shows for widow's numbers. Um, you're gonna be more likely to find actual marriage certificates in the files if a widow applied for a pension, more likely to have information on children if a widow applied for a pension. But the questionnaires we covered at the beginning were given out to all soldiers in the early 1890s. So if your ancestor was alive 1890 or further, they started filling those out trying to get ready for the flood of widow's claims they were starting to have so that they already had proof that the soldier was married and they could confirm it without going through so much trouble. So you will still find information on family even if the, the widow or her children never applied for a pension. Okay, so the gentleman in the back was asking about the Pension Act and why it was taking so long for certain claims to go through and when the Pension Act was passed. The answer is there were dozens of Pension Acts. They kept issuing them and they kept changing the rules on these veterans. So it could be a very exhausting process. Um, and I think one of the unfortunate things that we've witnessed after reviewing so many pensions is that the examiners for pension claims, their goal was to deny the claim. So it's like modern insurance, we're familiar. Um, so they really had to prove a lot of things in many instances to get claims through. And it just kind of depended on if you had a doctor, the pension department, the, the Bureau of Pensions was already familiar with, they were like more inclined to accept his assessment that you were sick if you had people living around you that already had pensions that had been accepted, they were more inclined if the pensioners who had already been approved said, yes, he also was sick during the war, we were sick together, more inclined to accept your claim, but it really depended on the person and whatever hole they decided to try and poke in your claim, how quickly it got pushed through. So yes, excellent question. Government's always been difficult. <laughs> Okay, so going back to our T289 pension indexes, one of my favorite things that these include, that the T288 pensions indexes do not include, are death dates. They don't always have them, but they frequently do. So if you're trying to confirm if the soldier is the same person as your ancestor, these death dates can be extremely, extremely helpful. Match it up, you know it's the same person. Also, you can see over at the side on the left column to the left of the pension numbers, you have these dates. That is when the, app, the certificates were granted. So you can look at those dates and determine when things were submitted and granted. So if there is not a death date, but you know that the widow applied for a claim in 1911, you know the soldier was dead, dead by 1911. So that can help you narrow things down. 
okay, our indexes on the right are the T288 pension indexes. These are accessible on Ancestry.com. When you go searching for an index on Ancestry.com, they do not let you search by regiment or regiment state. They list just the name, the so and it's claimant's name, so you can also have a widow's name or a child's name if the dependent applied. And then they list a state, but it is not the state that the soldier served in necessarily. It is the state they resided in when they applied for a pension. So that can be extremely confusing, especially if you have an ancestor that has a common name. So if your ancestor was Jacob Cohen, there are a lot of pensions for Jacob Cohen's. If you know the regiment, you are going to have to open the each uh, image until you find the correct regiment, unfortunately. The fold three ones are organized by regiment, so it's a little easier. But Ancestry, the ones on Ancestry, the T288 indexes, do include the dependent's name who applied. They do not have those in T289. So if you know your ancestor's wife's name but aren't sure where he served, the T288 indexes are great to narrow down which soldier might be your ancestor. The other thing T288 indexes have that T289 typically do not is the number at the very bottom Alex is highlighting. There is an XC in front of it. That, if there is an additional number written at the bottom, it will start with a C or an XC. That means that this is one of the pension files that was taken by the Veterans Affairs Office. There is still probably about a 70% chance that this is at the National Archives in DC, but it does mean there is a chance that this is in the archives facility in St. Louis, so it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to obtain. Okay, so we're gonna hand you back over to Adrian now so she can tell you about how our project is going to make all of these resources more easily accessible to you. So like I said, um, I wish that we were going live in 2020 and I also am glad we're not going live in 2020 because we have um, recently redesigned our uh, database and we have amazing search capabilities and we've got a lot of new records to review. We haven't even started the Confederacy. So we have some Confederate you know, records but we've been focusing mostly on the Union. When we do launch the website, um, what we think is the best thing about it is that it will be free. It, there will be no paywall. Um, it will be free to the public. Um, each soldier in our database will have his own page, his own record, and um, every document that we found, not just from the pension records, um, but, you know, everywhere. Um, those documents will be attached to his record and that may include photographs, it may include um, letters and um, census record records um, and you will be able to download those. So we're working on making sure that you know and everything that we've gathered we can pass along to you. Um, that's why we're also big fans of Reclaim the Records. Um, one of the things uh, that's very important to us is we are very, very uh, dependent upon uh, uh, descendants uh, to come forward and tell us about your ancestors. Because we started with this list, as we said, and we you know, have been adding names. I've got some statistics I can tell you guys about. But, um, but without the descendants, who have made so much sense out of, you know, the many Jacob Cohens or um, it's, so we're very beholden to you and we would love for you to come and tell us. And also, if you're not sure, uh, if we have your ancestor because we don't want anybody to be left out, um, please come talk to us and, you know, two way street, give us what you've got and we'll give you what we have. Um, and we very much enjoy working uh, with descendants. So, um, there we go. So, um, and if you don't reach out to us today at our mentoring hours, um, um, Eliza, who's not here today, she handles all of the incoming inquiries um, and just send her um, an email. Um, if you forget that, you can go on chappelle.org and there's actually a um, contact us form and you can sign up for updates um, about 
the roster project and then you'll be emailed um, as we have more and more developments. So, um, so basically now I guess any questions. The question was, is, uh, have we found any Jewish women fighting in the war? We have not. So certainly, if you know of a Jewish woman who masqueraded as a male soldier and fought, please let us know. So the question is, is um, basically immigrants and why would they fight in the Civil War? There was a lot of different reasons. There were bounties. Um, it was an easy way to make money. Um, there were a lot of, when you say patriotic? A lot of patriotic, and there's a lot of regiments formed specific, and companies specifically around different immigrant groups. So you have entire regiments that are known as the German regiment. So you're you finding... Come up here. Yeah, sorry. Just for the recording. You're finding a community right away when you show up in America, you know, your whole neighborhood is going and enlisting. So they kind of went in groups to stay together. Um, and like Adrian said, there was a volunteer bounty and it kept going up as the war went on as they needed soldiers. So you'd get $100 and then $200 for enlisting, which at the time was a lot of money. And because a lot of the economy in general was behind the war effort. You're coming over and there aren't necessarily jobs available for you when you get here. And this is by far the best paying job you're going to find. And also, also in 1863, they instituted the draft. So, um, and then there was a lot of political stuff going on because you didn't have to serve if you were foreign born. Um, but a lot of soldiers did because that's, kind of what everybody was doing at the time. So there's a lot of different reasons. Um, yes? Um, I'm interested in which cities had large amounts of... Which cities? So, um, and, and we're focusing today on the Union. Um, we're, you know, but I will say this about the Confederacy. Since you had conscription from the beginning, um, there's... Yeah, right. Um, there's there's a really wonderful accounting of, of uh, a journalist who walks into Savannah, I think it's in 1863, and he notes that the only males in town are in short pants, um, or they're blind, or they're crippled. So we believe in the South there was, you know, you didn't want to be stuck at home with the ladies. Everybody went to war. Um, you wanted to say something? Yeah. New York City, I would say, in terms of the union, probably the most in terms of what we're seeing enlistment, which makes sense. That's large, large population of Jews. Chicago, also very common. Boston, interestingly enough, not as many Jews enlisting up there because they had strict rules about Jews living there at that time. So there weren't there wasn't as big a Jewish population in Boston as we think of now. Um, Philadelphia had a pretty sizable group enlisting, obviously like a lot of major trade cities, as one would expect, higher numbers, but they were really enlisting from everywhere. And what Adrian was saying about the draft with the Confederacy, so both drafts started in 1862. The Confederates started first, but the Confederates was much more inclusive and kept getting broader and broader throughout the war. Um, so it got to the point where if you were a male, I think it's age 55, up to 55, and as young as 14, you could get drafted, so. So one, so the question is, is you know, how are we gonna flesh this out? One of the things that uh, the database that we'll be launching is, in fact, a database. So it's searchable, um, you know, so it's not a narrative. But because of the stories, um, we have contracted with an author who's going to be writing a book about this project and the soldiers. He's written other books that you've probably read, um, and he's, uh, I, I think his gift is he can take just mundane, boring data type and turn them into amazing stories. And so we're not really sure where, whether we're going to do a Union and Confederate book. We're not sure, you know, but, but one of the things that absolutely will be in will be these stories. So that's another, you know, incentive to, you know, come to us with your, your ancestors. Yes, ma'am. So 
So the, right, thank you. Um, about Confederate pension records, they do exist. They are not stored at the National Archives. And the way they're organized is in the state where the soldier was living when he applied. So if you fought for Georgia, and then after the war, you moved to Alabama and applied for your pension, that pension's gonna be in the Alabama State Archives. Okay, so her question was, if you have a gentleman who served in the Confederacy in Louisiana, but then moved to New York City after the war, if he had a pension, where would it be? So as a Confederate veteran, you could do one of two things. You could apply for a pension in the state you were living in. If it was a Confederate state, obviously union states are not going to issue you a pension. Um, or you could apply in the state that you served. So if your ancestor was living in New York City, they could have written back to Louisiana to try and get a pension. We will say we have only like just started our Confederate research, but Confederate pensions can be very difficult to track down. There are a few states that have them online at Ancestry um, and a few that have at least the applications digitized and available online, but it is a much more arduous process. And hopefully we can come back here in a year or two knowing more and maybe talk about how to do that in more detail because we'll have more experience. <laughs> One other, one other thing I wanted to say about applying for a pension, it's very interesting, um, and this is just trends that we've noticed, um, you would think that all soldiers who were wounded um, during the war would apply for a pension, and we found in certain cities like Philadelphia, um, you, you didn't apply for a pension if you were wealthy because why would you want government money? So, but we found with a lot of the Confederate pensions, it's mostly indigent people who are applying for them. Um, so the, the reasons for applying for a pension in addition to the government's listed eligibility reasons, there's also a lot of social and psychological reasons that people applied. So um, there was another question, yes. So the question is, um, it was your great, great grand uncle? Okay, um, w uh, lived in Tennessee and was a spy for the union and would we add him? So one of the things that we do um, is we have a very academic approach to our project and um, we, we need proofs, um, usually in documentation. So we do have um, a soldier in our database who was a spy, and that's because there are records uh, from the U.S. government about his spy work. And so, yes, if we can find such documentation that identifies your ancestor as working for the government, um, wearing a black suit, um, you know, those types of things, absolutely we would include him, yes. <laughs> Question number two is, who is Chappelle? Um, you can Google uh, Benjamin Chappelle. Um, he is the founder of the foundation. Um, he is a collector, and he loves history. Um, you can read about, um, you're probably familiar with the name if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, their archives, um, I believe it's his father, um, father and mother, um, uh, dedicate, or um, the archives are named after them. And one of the reasons that I love working for Mr. Chappelle is his personal mission and the goal of his foundation is to humanize history. And he is just so excited about the work that we're doing. And as I said in the video, um, you know, without such very generous funding, um, a project like this just never gets done. It doesn't, you know, it's not a Spielberg movie, you know, and it's detailed, but, but uh, as you all know, it's pretty exciting when, you know, your ancestor who is just doing his thing is featured in this, you know, very large website. So. So the question is, is yes, our focus is on the Civil War and would we moving forward uh, include other wars? 
Well, sure, we would love that. Um, it's, um, but there are no plans for doing that. Um, and, and I will tell you that when I started on this project eight years ago, um, it was a part-time job um, and it was supposed to last for a year. Um, a year and a half later, when I first hired Caitlin, I said, Caitlin, um, it's a one year job. Um, it's full time, but it's just for one year. And then a year later, when we hired Alex, I said, okay, it's for one year, um, but it's a full time job. And so here we are. So we just keep finding exciting things. And this project has, it was originally supposed to be nothing but updating Simon Wolf's book. But we just kept finding all these amazing genealogical things. And so we've kind of, we've broadened the scope of the project because it's cool. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Was that anything else? Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Are we looking for volunteers? Uh, absolutely. You can email us. And um, what I usually, we do. We have, we have a gentleman in Wisconsin that we've been working with for a number of years. Uh, we have a translator uh, who reads uh, old German. Uh, we love him. Um, and uh, so, yeah, depending on what you want to do, absolutely get uh, come get a card, and we'd love to talk. Absolutely. Anybody else? No? Okay. So we hope to come back and um, when our project is ready to launch and tell you guys all about it. But thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you.